lip sandwiches where you have that hard mouthpiece in between the teeth and the lips. And you've got that sandwich in there. That's that's counterproductive. You're freezing the muscles into place so the fibers can't move. Therefore, they do not develop. So what, how do you get around that? You allow the air to dictate the tension. You play more relaxed. You play more natural. This episode contains adult language and adult humor. Since when have trumpet players ever been considered adult? If you are easily offended by these types of conversations, consider switching to the oboe. Welcome to the Trumpet Gurus Hang Podcast. I'm your host, Jose Johnson. My guest for this episode is Larry Marigliano. Larry understands the struggle. At the start of his career, Larry made a name for himself with his powerful chops. Larry toured and recorded with some of the biggest names in gospel music and sailed the high seas on cruise ships as a player and musical director. But Larry's had his share of chop problems as well, and his research led to the creation of the compression training system and a way to help other players find a better way to regain or maintain their chops. So pour yourself a big glass, pull up a chair, and let the hang begin. All right, and we're back with another episode of The Trumpet Guru's Hang, and I am with Larry Marigliano. Larry, and my good friend, such a, a strong Irish name there. Uh, <laughs> good to see you. It's been a long time, my friend. You know, it's, it's funny you should say Irish because I'm 76% Celtic. Oh, I did not know. <laughs> You're not far off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good thing I didn't say a good Polish name, so I went away off base then. Um, so it's it's good to see you. Um, you know, I, I think that we first met online uh, several years ago. I did, it was right around Thanksgiving. I did I did a trumpet lesson with you, a, a virtual trumpet That's lesson. That's right. Yes. And uh, you know, you had some really amazing stuff to share, and I got turned on to you know your trumpet legacy stuff. And you've gone through this kind of metamorphosis uh, over the years. You know, from from being the player to being, uh, I mean, I'm sure you've always been the educator, but you know, you, you became a little bit better known as from the educational standpoint. And then now with the stuff that you're doing with your, your CTS. And so I want to touch on all of that, but why don't we just get started at kind of, kind of the beginning and, uh, your, your journey as, as a player, because you've had a really interesting career as a player, you've done a whole lot of different stuff. So where did you start and how did you end up where you're at right now? My father was a trumpet player, and he'd been off the horn for a lot of years, but, you know, I guess maybe I wanted to get his attention. You know, he didn't live with me. I was estranged from my father, but I did. I, by the time I was 18 years old, I, I ended up becoming a really good trumpet player. So we started out together. My father and I both played in big bands together in San Diego when I was 16, 17, 18 years old and had a wonderful time showing up my father. You know, it sounds yeah. like to do that, and, and I did, <laughs> at least in that category. So uh, the, I started in Escondido doing uh, uh, big bands down there, the Eddie Stangler Big Band. My very first gig was on the old Queen Mary. She sat in Long Beach Park on New Year's Eve. And um, they couldn't find a third trumpet player for that night because everybody was booked. So my trumpet teacher told them, the leader that I was a good reader, so they hired me. And I'll never forget the first thing I played was Bobby um, Hackett's a solo on string of pearls. Da, 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 da. Well, I sight read it perfectly. I stood up and I sat down and I went over the back of the bandstand. Six foot down, I fell. Fortunately, they put a bunch of music boxes underneath their cardboard boxes where he kept his book. And that broke my fall. And I came running up and brushed myself off and finished the set. But, you know, I was really embarrassed. And I wanted to show these guys, that, you know, I'm not just a kid. I know what I was talking about. Well, we ended the, the set with, um, uh, I, I think it was In the Mood, and uh, it was In the Mood. There was a figure that said, but da 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 is how the lead player did it, which was an eighth note fly followed by a quarter note, and he played it short. Well, I didn't like that because my trumpet teacher and, and, and my band director told me if it's swing, it was supposed to be do da 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 long, short, you know, instead of short, long, it was supposed to be long, short, so it would swing. So I went up to him during the set, the lead trumpet player, and I said, you know, sir, I, my band director always told me that if a swing, we were supposed to phrase it, da, 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 and you phrase da, 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 da. Well, he looked at me really sternly, and he 
takes his glasses up over his brow and he says, son, when I recorded that with Glenn Miller, I phrased it my way. It was Johnny Best. Oh, boy. <laughs> One of the original Glenn Miller section. I didn't know who he was. He was just an avocado farmer here in town. You know, that's how I, I didn't know he was a professional. Uh -huh. So I learned something that day. I learned that, you know, you never, ever question the lead trumpet player, you know, and and then you never know who you're speaking to either. So I, it was insert mouth, uh, or, or open mouth, insert foot. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, that's and that's really interesting because, you know, those are two really crucial points, I think, for any, well, any person, but specifically, you know, as musicians, working musicians, because so much of what we do is relational. You know, it's if you're in the section, you know, follow the lead of the leader and, uh, you know, and you do never, you never know who you're talking to. You and, never know. That's right. So don't make any assumptions, you know, <laughs> be humble and listen, learn. <laughs> you know what they say about making assumptions. But you asked how I so that's how I started. And that band and that band out was my school. That was my college. I mean, I was sitting next to guys who played with Glenn Miller, Jan Garber, you know, all the old big bands, all the old commercial big bands as well. They mm -hmm. were good players and, and they took me under their wing and they taught me how to play. And by the time I was uh, a junior in high school, I'd already had a couple of years experience playing with professional big bands. So I'd learned a lot. And then I went right out from high school to um, uh, Orange County, where I started playing with people like Daryl Gardner, who was a really fine trumpet player, and, and doing live gospel television shows uh, at, at, at Melody Land. Of course, a lot of the same players were working at Disneyland. So that gave me my very first gig at Disneyland back in 1976 in Tom Rainier's band called Disco Fantasy. And there I was sitting with people like Ron King, Alan Kaplan on trombone, uh, Tom Rainier on piano. I mean, incredible drummers, incredible uh, bass players would come in and, you know, and sub. I think John Patitucci would sub from time to time. On and on and on back in those days, there was just monsters. And I was just a kid. And I got to learn from these guys. And I got to learn what it was all about. And so... 76 gave me that gig in 1977. I went on the road with a gospel group called Truth. I stayed with them until 78 when I went to, to the Bill Gaither Trio, which is a very world, uh, very famous gospel group, probably one of the most uh, prolific gospel writers in history. And we were playing big houses like the Madison Square Garden Complex, back then the Omni in Georgia, which was torn down now. But all the, the main houses all across the United States, I got to play them, 50,000 seats in theaters. Right. And so I went from there back to Disney. And I, I was doing a lot of sub work and I'm making my living there with the Fanfare Trumpets next to another fam a, a famous guy who ended up being a great trumpet engineer, Bob Malone. And I would play in that same band together. And that started my Disney career. And from there, I went to the Disneyland band. In 1980, I became the lead trumpet player of the Disneyland band. And I held that position until uh, around 1986. And then well, Wayne Bergeron, he took my place there. Can you imagine Wayne took my place there? I don't think he lasted long because he went up to, to fame and fortune from there. But, you know, he um, it was kind of, a, it's kind of a neat little bit of trivia that Wayne took my place on that band. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So I went from there to um, uh, the the PTL show with Jim and Tammy Faye Baker. Mm -hmm. and from Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, I went to Orlando, Florida, where I played with everybody out there. Back then, there was like 487 full-time musicians, and 10% of them were trumpet players. So if you came to town and put your shingle up, professional trumpet player, you were going to go to work. Mm -hmm. They needed that many subs. So uh, any given day, I'd be working with a different group, Walt Disney World Band, the MGM Studios Band, the, the Disney Girls Band with Dave, Dave Trigg and Frank Green and all those cats. We were just kids together all coming up at Disney. Now that look at those guys. They're still stars. They're amazing players. But it was not neat to be there and to rub shoulders with them during that period of their lives. So I went from Walt Disney World to uh, coming home, and I lost a bunch of teeth. I'm talking a lot of teeth. And it became very um, uncomfortable to play the trumpet. So I quit. I stopped mm -hmm. playing. I didn't even listen to music. I wouldn't even listen to the radio because it would depress me. So I sold cars for a living for seven years. 
until one day, a uh, very nice dentist friend of mine um, donated his work and gave me almost $17,000 worth of dental work, reestablishing my mouth, allowing me to play the trumpet again. Wow. Two days after getting my teeth installed, I became the musical director of the QE2. And um, the rest is history. And I've been playing ever since again. But I was off the horn for several years. Mm -hmm. So that's, in a nutshell, that's my career. And I've wow. done a lot of things. You know, musical director of 18 ships, all total. Mm -hmm. um, and I've sailed on 26 of them all over the world. Wow. Yeah, that you 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 have seen and 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 experienced a whole lot, and uh, you know, just uh, talking about uh, you know taking that time off. Um, as I was having this this thought uh, the other day, because yeah, I I did the same thing. Uh, I took I took a period of time off about about seven years where where I didn't. didn't yeah, touch me too. And um, you know, it was it was for different reasons. It was a conscious choice. I, I made that decision to, to to address some other issues that I, that were more important to me at that time, but I mean I can understand how you felt because it's, it was like I I didn't want to listen to trumpet music, you know. Yeah, I, I, before that it was like I was listening to Maynard all the time and Jace and Woody and Freddie and you know Miles and all those guys, and it's like at that point I just didn't want to hear it because it just it, it just reminded me of of uh, what I'd given up. But you know eventually I did come back to it and. I feel like for the for the better, uh, the time time solved the problems I was working on. But more importantly, uh, I think it helped me to develop a better relationship with uh, music and what it, what it means to me. So, uh, what what are like what are some of the things that you experienced in terms of uh, there's the physical return and then there's the mental and emotional return. So, uh, how did you how did you work yourself through those different processes? Well, you know, when I got my teeth fixed and I had the ability to form an armature again, I was really, really grateful. I thought, well, geez, I can try this again. You know, and, and the, the business environment was a lot worse than it had been before. But I thought, what the heck, I'm going to do it for my own self-satisfaction. I'm going to get as good as I can get for my own. And let's just see what happens with this. It, obviously, when you don't have teeth, you don't have confidence. And that was a big factor. It probably took me six to seven months before I could reach a double C again. But once I was solid up there and had some endurance, um, it was like I was like a little boy, you know, having a great, having fun every day. I was out playing every day. I get to play. And so whereas before I became kind of jaded because, you know, obviously when you're making a living playing the trumpet, you're not 90 percent of the time you're not playing music you want to play you're playing music you have to play so there's a burnout factor and i reached that area i mean i wasn't just bad physically where i couldn't play the trumpet because of my teeth i was burnt out i was like yeah that's time to do something else this thing's not paying very much anymore i don't have any teeth let's just face the reality of the fact that i need to get a, get into something else mm -hmm. Well, I was burnt out. When I got back and had the ability to play again, I was excited about playing again. And I, I, I've retained that excitement. You know, I, I, I've learned this. We, at the end of the day, we play for our own self-satisfaction. We're not there to prove anything. You know, we're not there to, to make a fortune. We're not there... We're playing for our own self-satisfaction, where we are meeting our own levels of, 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 of expertise. And when we're able to go on the gig, play it down the way we know it's supposed to be, and go home satisfied, that's the best feeling in the world. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That, you know, I feel like, um, you know, I, you never wish anything bad happened to anybody, obviously. Um, but sometimes those are the things that we need to have happen to us to give us a moment, those moments of clarity, because it's so easy to just get caught up into the cycle and just, you know, thinking about it and, and, uh, only viewing it from that perspective. But, but sometimes when, when something happens, it makes you reevaluate, uh, what something means, whether it be playing trumpet or just life in general, you know, it, it seems like, you know, if all of us could come to that realization that life is precious and wonderful 
without having to go through some of the stuff that makes us finally realize that life is precious and wonderful, we would enjoy ourselves so much more, you know? Oh, yeah. 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 So let me ask you this, uh, you know, when you, cause you said, you know, you're seven years off, um, new teeth, uh, which obviously means that your embouchure had to be adjusted because, you know, your, your, your dental structure has changed. So, so things are going to change. Is this, uh, something that helped you to, um, better capsulize all those different, uh, teaching influences that you had to kind of, to create a, a methodology that worked for you? I went back to my roots. I went, and more importantly, I went back to Roy Stevens. You know, the pencil exercise, the palm exercise, the, uh, and all those exercises tr teach us to find the most efficient way of making vibration here. You know, I, you know, I can play a lot of double high C today on the palm of my hand, my fingers extended, because I've got the right alignment happening. I've got the right coordination of muscular motion happening. And you can't play a double high C on the palm of your hand unless that's all there in place, unless that foundation is in place, because it'll just fall apart otherwise. So I went back to my roots. I went back to the teaching of Roy Stevens to find my ombudsman again. And there was that process because, you know, after so many years, we forget. You, it, it, it's like riding a bicycle in a certain way, but at the other when you have completely different pedals and a different bicycle, like I did, new teeth, you have to find it again. It's going to feel different. Um, let me give you an example. Um, I here, forgive me. Um, some people get grossed out by this, but I lost this tooth fairly recently. This tooth right here, right there, dead center of my embouchure. Well, I had been booked to play a Maynard Ferguson tribute at Catalina's Jazz Club. And the very day that I had this put in, so I had a tooth back. And I picked up my horn, and I could have played G. I could play a high G. I couldn't play. And the tune that I was doing, Watermelon, call, a man called for double high Ds. I was like, what am I going to do? I couldn't play the high G. You know what I did? I took a pencil. And did the Roy Stephen pencil exercise all the way to the gig. You see, this tooth here, even though it looks good, is fake. And you don't have any sensory percep perception there. I didn't realize that I always gauge the aperture with my tongue on the tooth. Mm. And that's where I would find that placement. So you'll see me if I play. I'm always sticking my tongue between my teeth. Well, I was gauging that, that aperture. And now I had no sensory perception perception of that, so I lost where it was. So I went all the way, praying that I was going to be able to play. I went all the way to the gig in the car, about an hour drive, doing the palm exercise, uh, the pencil exercise. It's online. I nailed it. <laughs> double Gs, double Ds. And it was all a matter of re- <laughs> finding my body where the aperture needed to be. And since I'd lost a sensory perception here, I had to use other means to show me where it was. Mm -hmm. So there's all sorts of tricks we can learn to help us with that. But going back to our basics, going back to our uh, what made us great players and being uh, good players in the, in the first place. Yeah. You know? yeah. So, so uh, in terms of... I mean, Let's actually just kind of get down down the road of, of methodology right here, um, because you you were influenced by the Stevens method, which um, I've always found fascinating because it, it just works really well with me in, in my natural physiology. It just it it it's perfect. It's a perfect fit. Um, and but you've also studied with so many other people uh, that each have. Uh, a very unique approach and, you know, very kind of specific approach to playing. Um, so who, who are some of the other people, I mean, for people who don't know, well, I mean, I, I know who well, they are, but let's talk about who, who your other influences were. My in main influence and the man who I studied with the most extensively was uh, a guy by the name of Harold Mitchell, who was uh, principal at 20, uh, 20, 20th Century Fox, right next to co-principal with Rafael Mendez. He was the, uh, the very first recording trumpet player uh, having recorded the soundtracks to Gone with the Wind, um, uh, the jazz singer, the very first uh, talkie movie, um, 
he was the top call vaudeville player in Los Angeles, and the same contractors ended up contracting for the movie scores. So he did all the old Max Steiner scores, this and that. So I learned legit, and I learned how to how to transpose in every key. I learned how to articulate correctly. I learned how to use my ears through him. And I spent on and off for 12 years, seven years solid with him, but over a 12-year period. And um, I learned most from him about being a musician and about the technical aspects of playing. And then Roy Stevens taught me how to play efficiently and how to, to uh, use the air. But, you know, the thing about Roy Stevens is he was the first to really talk about compression within the oral cavity. He didn't call it compression. He, he, he talked about the fact that the air dictates the tension in the armature. As the air goes this way, the tension automatically responds to that. The, 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 I call it compression. He called it tension. So the air dictates the tension in the muscles of the face. Surprisingly enough, that's the foundation to this system. We'll talk about that later. But that's where I got the idea from Roy Stevens. And sure enough, it's true. So all these different guys that I studied with all had their different contributions towards my success, but they all had the, a different way of saying the same truth. Mm -hmm. It's the same truth. No matter what you – they're all saying the same thing. Sometimes the way they would explain it would almost make it sound like they were opposing views, but they weren't. They were talking about the same truth. So what I tried to do when I wrote A Trumpet Legacy was try to distill that line of truth into, you know, to clarify it into the one line of truth that it is. And I think I was able to um, do a pretty good job of, of coming up, uh, of bringing those arguments to the table. Um, Roy Stevens taught us how to use tone production efficiently. He taught me how to play a double IC on the palm of my hand. He taught me how to ride the airstream and find that balance. And a lot of that comes from a relaxation, believe it or not. You let the air do the work. You let the air do the tension. You don't munch down and do any. There are two things that will really hurt a brass player. Predetermined tension. Oh, I've got to look pretty when I play. I've got to hold everything in. And for God's sake, don't let any air in my pocket, in, in my in my mouth. Don't do that. So that predetermined tension freezes muscles into place. We can't move the muscle fibers. So how how can they grow? We're like the guy who walks up to the barbells and goes rrr, 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 instead of going through the full range of motion. Mm -hmm. We don't work the muscle fibers. So. What Roy taught me was to allow the air to do the work. And so that means you need a relaxed muscular embouchure. And you need air and, and that is responding to the air. So the muscles of the embouchure are responding to the air, and that's what creates the tension. You don't go predetermined tension because that locks everything into place. The second thing that, uh, is pressure, strong arm pressure. You know, <laughs> lip sandwiches where you have that hard mouthpiece in between the teeth and the lips. You've got that sandwich in there. That's that's counterproductive. You're freezing the muscles into place so the fibers can't move. Therefore, they do not develop. So what, how do you get around that? You allow the air to dictate the tension. You play more relaxed. You play more naturally. The best trumpet players are the ones that play the trumpet naturally. How do we play a trumpet naturally? Well, we don't buzz the trumpet. We blow a trumpet. And it's those very same muscles that the caveman used to stoke his fire that we used to play the trumpet. So just picking it up and that's how we play. And that's the correct use of these muscles. Watch them. They're holding back the airstream. And the stronger these muscles are, the better we're able to hold back and focus that compression of air through the vibrating aperture. Yeah. That's what it's about. Yeah. Well, you know, and it's the, uh, <clears throat> I think it, one of the things that I found fascinating, fascinating when, when I worked with you was uh, that you, you clarified a lot of the things about the Stevens method that I had been taught before, but didn't, I wasn't taught, in the way that you taught them, uh, and you gave you you gave some details. It's like, oh, uh, you know, no one ever talked about that, and then it made complete sense when I was able to see it in the complete package. But 
like uh, people misconstrue like the uh, the plane of double C on your on you know the open palm or you know hanging the, the horn on a, on the thread or whatever you want to do about the you know the the concept of no pressure, and it's like well no there's no you, there's no such thing as playing with no pressure, yeah because right. because in terms of physics you know if you've got a force going forward which is your air, there has to be some level of compensation in order for things to work, you know, so you have to have the right balance of outward and inward pressure yes. to create that point of resistance or compression or however you want to think about it, that's going to, that, that's going to create the vibrations. So if, if it's not that you use more pressure to play higher, you use enough pressure to maintain that, that let's call it balance pressure. Balanced pressure. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, I like ratios because when people think balance, because this is something I talk about in, in, in the mindfulness stuff I do and martial arts stuff that I've done, is when we think about balance, we tend to think about things as being 50-50. We tend to think about balance as being static. When balance is dynamic, everything in the universe is a changing system. And if one part of the system changes because of the holistic nature, everything needs to change. It's a question of how much. So it's the right ratio. So, you know, when the air increases, this needs to increase. How much? Well, you got to figure that out because that's going to be dependent on a lot of other factors. No one can just say, you know, well, well the place I, I say, I, you know, I, 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 when you say figure that out, that can be misleading because what we have to do is experience it. Why? Because it's a muscular coordination that occurs. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we have to use over and over again so that we can find that coordination and memorize what it feels like so that my muscle mis memory kicks in. Um, it's, it's crazy, you know, I, I, I've i had gigs where I'm doing production shows for, sometimes I've had to do three in a day with just half an hour break in between, and they're tough production shows, tough. And no matter how tired I was, I'd always make the high note on the end because I had, in my mind, I knew exactly what it felt like to play that high note and that muscle memory would kick in and no matter how fatigued I, I was, I can still play it yeah. because I because of the muscular memory, muscle memory. You knew where it was. You just, there it is. So yeah. we've got to develop muscle memory for the correct form, which, and the only way we're going to develop that is by correct repetition, correct repetition of, of, the, of the same set. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and I think you, you hit on a, on a key word there, at least for me, it's experiment uh, and experience. So, uh, so our ability to experience something uh, like walking, you know, you, you can't, you can't teach a child to walk. Uh, you can't tell them how to walk. You can, you can give them some guidance, but ultimately the way they learn to walk is by walking and falling down, oh, walking. getting yeah. up and walking and falling down. And even like, you know, if you, you know, dealing with people who, uh, have had uh, any kind of accidents or neurological issues and they're having to relearn to walk. It's, it's so difficult for people because we have an idea of what it is that we're supposed to do. But then when the body isn't responding to that, our, bot, our brains are actually able to create new neural pathways that can allow us to compensate for the loss that we've had. But the problem is, is we still keep trying to do things the same damn way because that's the way we've always done them as opposed to experiencing, well, you know, if this isn't working, what, what, how do I need to think about this differently to get the result that I want to get? And I think a lot of times players get caught into that, that uh, pedagogical um, dogma that there's this one way and, you know, maybe it worked for you or maybe it worked for them, but it's not giving you the results that you need consistently. So like with your tooth, you know, how do you, how do you compensate for that change? I had to find it. I had, how did I find it? I went back to the ba basics. Um, it, 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 this goes right along with the beginning of the conversation of what did you do after those years off? How did you get it back? I had to experience it. I had to find it. I'd forgotten. I, and not only had I, had I forgotten, I had a new set of platform here, a new platform to set the mouthpiece on. It was different. So I had to find it again. You know, teeth, uh, tooth lengths were different. Uh, uh, on and on and on positions were different you know some teeth were gone altogether what do you do you know now i've got a framework to work with a you know a, a prosthetic how do i deal with that you learn by experiencing it 
And how do you experience it? By following these wonderful exercises that people like Roy Stevens gave us to find it. Roy Stevens, Maggio, Clyde Gordon, they, all these exercises that they gave us, pedal tones and the like, are leading us towards the correct way of playing the trumpet. You know, they can't tell each and every one of you how to play with all your different uh, structures here, but they can lead you into playing correctly by giving you exercises that will force the body into those positions. Pedal tones, for example, relaxation, as well as a little bit more forward. We're lengthening the vibrating aperture. Um, that links and brings it in. Uh, the palm exercise. Well, you can't use a lot of pressure. The only amount of pressure you have is what the friction of the horn provides you against the palm of your hand. That's not much. So we are forced into a position whereby the muscles of the face have to respond to the compression of air. So what we're doing in essence there, and this is important, mark these words in italics, we are learning to exchange the negative uh, energy of pressure, strong arm pressure, for the positive energy of compression. The energy has to come from somewhere. It's on the palm of your hand. You can't get much pressure going on. So what are we, how are we going to compensate? We're going to build up compression from within the oral cavity. That's not to say we're to close off our throat every time we play. It's a continuous process. We start with a compression process from the bottom of our feet. We plant them like a weightlifter so that our body has a good platform. We take a deep, full breath, and we open everything up in the, in, in the, in the chest cavity, and we allow the, the muscles of the, of the, the intercostals and the, and the um, a diaphragm to push the air up forward through a big, open throat into the oral cavity, where it is further compressed and focused forward through the vibrating aperture. That's how... Maynard Ferguson played. That's how anybody who has uh, efficiency in the upper register plays. You're exchanging strong arm pressure for the positive uh, energy of compression. Energy has to come from somewhere. It's a balance. Where are you going to put it? Somewhere where it's going to hurt you all the time, beating your face up to the point where you're, you, 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 you're swelling because you're allergic to a lip sandwiches. Or are you going to allow the compression to do the work? And if you're allowing the compression to do the work or the air to do the work, you are able to last for days and days and days. You really are because you're playing efficiently and you're not you're not hurting your tissues. Right. That's the, that's the that's it in a nutshell. Yeah. Well, yeah. There, there's a there's just so much there, man. We could just we could talk on that for like thirty years, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I have. <laughs> I wake up and start talking to myself about it. <laughs> well, um, yeah, and one of the other one of the other people that, that you've had influenced uh, the, that influenced you um, that you know is another. I think the, their method has has been misunderstood uh, is Cat Anderson, and uh, I know that you you spent yeah. some time you 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 and Jeff uh, have spent some time uh, well, working with Cat. Because of Jeff, I, I met Ken Anderson. I mean, Kat, uh, Jeff is, a, is about a year and a half older than I am, and he's, he's two years in school. And so when I was a junior, he was a sophomore, he was a senior. And I was a sophomore in high school when Cat Anderson came down and did a, a, a field show with our high school band. Of course, we were all just blown away. I'll never forget him playing a double high G so loud that it bounced off the concrete bleachers, and 150 members of the band just put their horns down and started laughing unmiked without a microphone just the acoustic bounce off of the concrete bleachers it was amazing well uh, jeff asked if we could take trumpet lessons so we did and that's what started my trek with him but what did he teach me he taught me how to play with my teeth closed what why are you telling a kid to practice his trumpet with his teeth closed just kind of sounds crazy doesn't it well it isn't Basically, what we're doing is he taught us to lengthen the vibrating aperture. That goes right down with people like Pops McLaughlin, who says to lengthen the vibrating aperture. That's his, by the way, he, he quoted, he, he coined that phrase. And that's exactly what we're doing. Just like Maggio talked to us about the chimpanzee, we're lengthening the vibrating aperture. Just like Clyde Gordon talked about puckering or, or contracting the, the, the muscles towards the center. Um, 
uh, Charlie Cole and, and he talk, called it a pucker. So what we're doing is we're linking the vibrating aperture, which puts a bunch of muscle up here, you know, and allows for more vibrating tissue. Well, think about the teeth closed position. You're like this. How are you going to get the air through the teeth for vibration? If they're smack dab on the teeth, they're not going to vibrate. There's too much pressure there. But if they're like slightly forward and relax, no problem. It's going to vibrate. So that's what the Whisper G is all about, putting us in a position where we're lengthening the vibrating aperture so that we're channeling the air through the sides of our mouth, through the front, like so. So as we play on the mouthpiece, instead of flat up against the mouthpiece, we have some flesh there. That's what it's all about. And that's why he had us practicing with our teeth closed. And sure enough, if you do that for 15, 20 minutes a day, it automatically puts you in that position and it starts to build the right muscles of the donut, as they call it. Mm -hmm. That's what that's about. So that's what Kat taught me. What a wonderful lesson. I've used it my entire career. It works. You can't argue with, with success. It works. Yeah. Well, and, and even just thinking about that, you know, you, you know, with, with the influences that you've had uh, with, uh, with Mitchell, with Stevens, with Kat, I mean, in either one of those guys had a lifetime of such valuable experience, both, uh, you know, just from the, the technical side of playing trumpet, but also the experience side, you know, the things that, that they had. Oh, it's amazing. You know, and they could have all written books that would last forever. You know, th then there's Carmine Caruso, who really nailed it when it comes to finding the balance on the airstream. Surprisingly enough, he wasn't a brass player. Carmine played the saxophone. Think about it. He played the saxophone. And he's teaching all the brass players how to play. What he was teaching was proper muscular coordination. And not only the coordination, but the timing of the coordination. I mean, when you've got these hundreds of muscles all together having to move at the same point in time, that's what he was about. You were, you, you were coordinating everything right there, too. So you had us tap our feet, uh, like, for example, the six notes. You better tap your feet with the metronome. And that gives the muscles of the body at one point in time or gives us a rhythm to go to so that we're finding that balance. So when you add all of these methodologies together, you get a ball of truth that become substantial that you can use to reinvent yourself as I did after I quit playing for so, so many years. I just used all those methods to get it back. Even though all this was different, I found it because of what I knew from them. Yeah. So I'm very grateful for all those experiences. Um, the compression training system has a lot to do with coordination and, and keeping the tension going. Um, and we can talk about that, how um, it's important to keep the tension solid throughout the, the exercise in the compression training system, just as it was with the six notes where you don't, Move the horn off your mouth and keep the, the tension there. So all these people led me into, this is the culmination of it. It really yeah. is. Yeah, so let, let's, let's talk about, the, about the, the compression training system a little bit more because uh, uh, that's like anything in the world of trumpet. You know, you, you're always going to find people who rave about it and people who rail against it uh well, but i mean what what i've seen i mean I, I i you know with complete disclosure i do have my i do a uh, whole second here i i have a compression training system uh myself and i use it and i'm using it right now since i'm, I'm rehabbing and can't play uh but you know there there are some some super super you know credible Artists, you know, people like uh, Mike Lovett, uh, Ron Rom, uh, Danny Falcone. I mean, people who are, are just, I mean, these are I, great. I met, I met a very famous trumpet player in the lobby of, uh, at a concert not too long ago, and I was shocked. 
he came up to me and thanked me for the CTS and says he used it all the time in his car. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm going to respect their privacy and not tell you who it was. But, uh, uh, you know, that's up to them if they want to come out in public. It's not up to me to out them with right. that. Right. Um, but I'm surprised. It, well, why should I be surprised? It works. Right. It really works. And, yes, we get a lot of people who are educated and they've got their stubborn ideas and, there's no way we're going to work in the trumpet armature unless there's sound coming out of a horn. That's how they feel. And I don't blame them for feeling that way. You know, that's what they've learned, whatever. But this is a valid idea. It's a valid system. It works wonders. And the benefit is that we don't have to uh, make any sound. You know, we can do it anywhere. We can take that little, this little pouch or kit with us. Anywhere, in a car, a, a, a submarine, anywhere you want to be, and you can practice your trumpet without bothering anybody. You can get chop time. You know, so for the busy professional who's working eight hours a day and wants to sound good on weekends, what a blessing. He can put that 15, spend 20 minutes with this thing at his desk and uh, on a break from work and have chops like he had when he was in college. So when you came up with the idea, I mean, what, what were some of the, like, uh, yeah, obviously it, it's taken in a lot of things that we've been talking about your, the, the things you learned from, from Stevens and, and, uh, you know, just all your other well, experiences. In 2013, when I published a Trump, by the way, I have an appointment on Monday to finish up the, all the, all the music for a trumpet legacy too. It's, I've been talking about it for years. We're finally getting it there. What a huge uh, volume of work that's going to be. Um, anyways, uh, I published A Trumpet Legacy, and with that, uh, an exercise I called the Hermetic Seal. I think on YouTube it's called the Maynard Ferguson Cat Anderson uh, Isometric, because it puts you in that position. So what you do is you block the end of your mouthpiece, and you blow against the resistance of a closed tube. Well, look what's happening. Does it look like I'm playing? It does. All the same muscles are at play. So that's a great exercise. It's free. You can just pick up your mouthpiece and use it. But it's isometric in nature. The muscle fibers don't move. So I got to thinking, if I could find a way to create variable back pressure against that, then the muscle fibers would move. And then I could, they'd stretch, they'd move, and they would learn to develop that way. Well, guess what? Watch. You see how it's pumping up the muscles of the donut? So I'm doing lifts just like I was going to the gym, only with my trumpet armature. What a great benefit. Now it's measurable. So we can, apply, because it's measurable, excuse me, we can apply the principles of muscle building all these years that human beings have been experimenting in the gym with learning how to build muscle we can now for the first time apply that to the brass armature and so that's what i did i wrote a i wrote a routine for progressive overload training it probably isn't the best for people who are playing all the time and have commitments but if you've got a couple of weeks where you can do nothing but this and use this as an augmentation to your practice um, without a whole lot more uh, uh, commitments in front of you, it's marvelous. It'll, you, you'll build strength faster than you ever had before, and you'll go farther than you ever have before as well. Suddenly, you're going to have chops. That's, what's, that's why it's a success. I've, I've sold almost 2,000 of them now. And with that many sales, I haven't had one person that has complained about it it's all been positive reviews because why because it works it's built on scientific principles that actually work the muscle fibers of the face are working and they're working that balance of air that we're talking about they're working those muscles that exchange strong arm pressure for the positive energy of compression and here it is this is proof i'm gonna i'm gonna blow on it as if i was just using my lungs That's as far as I go. 
Now watch when I use the muscles of compression from within the oral cavity. What a difference. So now, because we're using a new technique that allows us to generate all that compression inside your oral cavity, we can, we can expose the muscles of the face to a much higher weight load than they've ever had to lift before. So the voila, barbells for the trumpet have been, has been invented. Basically, that's it. And you can use it for, as, as a weightlifting tool, or you can use it as just a purely maintenance tool using your intuition. I know how much exercise I need. Let's just go quietly. Low compression. This feels more like playing the trumpet until you get a burn. What a way to go. You know, now we're building the muscle fibers of endurance. By the way, they're different. The muscle fibers of bulk muscles, which we use in the upper register, are are metabolized with oxygen and they work a little bit differently than the muscle fibers that work for endurance. You know, I, this has always been a secret before, but guess what? Now it's scientific. We can really figure it out. So if we just work the bulk, bulk muscles, we're going to be the hero who can play a double high C on the end of a tune. But if we don't work the endurance fibers, then we're going to end up being the trumpet player who falls apart on shining stockings. Can't make it through the shot course. So now we have a way of working both the bulk fibers and now the endurance fibers. I hold this out for like three or four minutes while watching TV, just very lightly at low compression. I'll hold a long tone on the compression. Breathing through my nose. Until I can get a burn. And I can do that anywhere without bothering any, I could, I've got a sleeping wife next to me. I can do it in bed. It doesn't matter. And I, I can get as much a workout doing this, or even more of a workout than I can practicing the trumpet for four or five hours. It works. <laughs> well, you know, that, that's great. And it's the, like with, with all things, the, it's the willingness to question the assumptions um, you know, of, you know, why, why hasn't someone done this before? Why, why well, it's such a simple idea? It should have been thought of before, yeah. but it took well, my, the, all my years of study with Roy Stevens and stuff, for example, here's, here's the pencil exercise. Watch this. That's the Roy Stevens pencil exercise with pure compression. It's taken me all my years of knowledge, of learning, working with all these people to come up with this idea. And, it's, and at the end of the day, once it's finally explained, everybody says, oh, my gosh, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's it. The, be the best ideas are actually the simplest. You yes. Know? So it, it's uh, – but with with what you've been doing, um, I mean, obviously, it, you, you have the, the, the hardware – uh, but you also have, uh, you know, the component. Uh, you've done it. You've done a really fantastic job of building a community uh, around the product as well. Uh, you know, so uh, well, it, it, you know, it's brand new territory. It's a new skill. It's a new. It's not playing the trumpet. It's doing something different. We're building the muscles of the face to use a brass instrument, but it's a different thing. So I wanted to learn from everybody who's using it. So I've done my best to engage as many people as possible to get their feedback so I could learn how to improve the routines. So doing a good job, I don't know about that. I, all I did was engage my audience. And I think that's important. You want to hear from them. You want to listen to what they have to say and put it into action. Yeah. And that's why it's a club. That's why it's a, a crowd. And they're all using it. They're loving it. So that's great, you know. You know, we're helping each other that way. Yeah. Well, I uh, I look forward to being able to uh, give everybody some feedback on uh, on how I how the use of the CTS helps me through this period of, of six weeks of not being able to to pick up the horn. And then uh, once I get the news from my doctor, I think I've got two days to get ready for a gig. So uh, we'll we'll see. <laughs> well, let me just let me just quickly show you the correct way to use to do do reps because. A lot of the guys don't bother the video with the video. They pick it up and they just do it. Well, they've got to keep the, the tension steady. The guys who are going are doing it wrong. That's not, not going to do anything. Back to six notes on Carmine Caruso. Watch what happens.
I did everything slow and methodic, and I never let the tension go all the way down. I let the tension come back up. And that's what it's supposed to be, like Carmine Caruso. We could add the element of time to it, but the metronome was you wanted to go one and two and three. And, and that might be a good idea. I haven't tried that yet, but maybe I should, because we're teaching muscular coordination. So I, I just started playing around with it yesterday, the other day, um, you know, experimenting. Uh, experiencing uh, with with doing um, like going up to uh, forty tour uh, down the tw down ten up twenty down ten up twenty down ten up twenty and trying to keep that accuracy of the placement of the uh, of the needle through consistent con uh, compression. So uh, that's something I've been playing with. So I'll let you know how that works too. So. Well, great. I'm looking forward to hearing you, uh, your feedback. You know, again, it's a brand new discipline. Yeah. We've, it's never been done before. So we're all learning from each other here. I, I laid it down in its basic form, but I'm really anxious to hear from everyone and how they're using it so that I can, Oh, well, for example, Andy Omdahl, great trumpet player. He was a, trumpet teacher at the Armed Forces School of Music for years in Norfolk, also a high school classmate of mine. He, um, he had, um, he just uses it very lightly. He'll hold it at like 20 tours for like three minutes and he'll practice and he'll go in and do it again, holding it low compression. And so he doesn't do the lifts, he just uses low compression and that works great for him. So, you know, just like the trumpet, we all have to find our own individual answers to what's going to work best for us, the individual, because we're all made differently. Right. You know, right. And my, my muscular condition is probably different than yours, you know? So we, I have to cater to that. And we all have to find our most uh, optimal amount of exercise suited to our own individual needs. Yeah. Well, and, and that's, that's always important, I think, because I, in trumpet and and I you know I always try to relate things back to to my my greatest amount of experience trumpet being one of them the other is, is you know my years as a martial arts teacher and it so many of the of the problems that I've dealt with with people have been because um, they have unrealistic unrealistic expectations uh, of what they should do based on what what their ultimate objective is so what I mean is is like you know. If you want to be a professional, whether you be a professional martial artist or professional trumpet player, it requires you to have a certain set of skills and they yeah. need to be at a certain level. And so the way that you need to train or practice is very specific. Yes. If, you, if you're just doing this because it's something you, that you want to do recreationally or, you know, you're, you're doing it for, you know, just just for the fun of it or you're you're you're, you're going to be a, a part timer, then to try and have a practice routine and a practice uh, concept that's the same as that is of a working pro, you, that's setting you up, you up for, for a lot of frustration and difficulty. So you know, it's understanding what you want to get and then structuring your practice based upon those end results that, that are really most important to you. I, I think that the benefit of using this, first of all, it is a new skill, it's mm -hmm. not a trumpet skill, it's a new skill. We're using the same muscles, but in order to do it properly, you have to learn a new skill. So you've got to get that down. But the important thing here is, is with uh, with the trumpet, it takes some four to eight hours a day to be in optimal condition. Mm -hmm. Who has time for that? Not certainly somebody who's working full time but as a professional. They may have gone to college. And they played a lot in college and had those kind of chops. They're frustrated because they don't have those chops anymore. Right. Because the, the trumpet is dependent on muscle for tone production. That's in muscle conditioning for tone production. So all I've done is given people a way to keep their muscles in the most premium, optimum uh, amount of shape, of, of strength, within a much shorter period of time without the frustration of tone production. All they have to do is work with this with the right technique and the right tension comes to the correct muscles. 
So we don't have to think about playing in tune. We don't have to think about the changes or the key signatures. All we're thinking about is muscular production, muscular exercise. So now we can zero in on just that and do it within, if I use the, this system for half hour a day, um, you know, the buzzing as well, everything that I've written down in the book, um, I, I can be as strong as I ever need to be in a half hour a day. What would take in the past three to four hours, I can do it in half an hour. Now, it's not going to do anything for my musicality, not for my, my coordination, my, my, you know, my finger skills or my tonguing. Won't do a damn thing for that, but it will keep the muscles of tone production at their most optimum amount of strength. And you, it's, and that strength for the first time ever is measurable. Yeah, look at it. I can measure my most optimum strength. I was pushing two forty earlier. I did two eighty. So I'm a little tired right now, but it's measurable. You can tell how much strength you have. Yeah. I mean, how many people can blow this to two eighty? Not many. It, yeah, not me. You got it, you know, it's like the Arnold Schwarzenegger of the trumpet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and like you were saying, you know, I, I think that, you know, the argument that people always have on, on, on things like this, on methods like this or, or tools or training, uh, training apparatus is, well, you know, it doesn't replace playing the trumpet. The only thing that, that's going to be playing the trumpet is playing the trumpet. Well, to, to degree, yeah, that's true. But in to degree, it's not because the trumpet is a physical uh, it, it, it is physical and there are, Very physical. you know, so, uh, that you're working a component, but the interesting thing about this is that to me, uh, is that this is a component that if you get it right, if you get it working, then it gives you the ability to do the other things. Because if you've got no chop strength, it doesn't mean that necessarily. Fall apart. Strength. I don't care how good a, a musician you are. If your chops aren't strong. You're going to sound like a beginner. That's all there is to it. And you're not going to be able to practice for very long. You know, if you if you need to practice four to eight hours, but you, you got no endurance to do that, uh, you know, how are you going to work on all your your articulation exercises and and your playing your changes and things like that? So having that that mus that base muscular strength uh, will provide you a foundation that everything else can be built on. So you're building on rock as opposed to building on sand. Let me read you a real quick story, like my story. Man, it sounds like you never missed a day. I took almost three years off the horn. When I decided it was time to start digging again, I got out my CTS, exactly, followed exactly the program for two weeks, the one I wrote down, and was feeling fantastic on the horn. On my first gig back, a four-hour dance party band I didn't chop out once and was strong enough the whole night. It was always a bit of a tough gig doing the usual horn heavy dance stuff, September, Bruno Mars, Michael Jackson, et cetera. And we go right from one song to the next, no breaks in the sets. At the end of the gig, my trombone player, a good friend who would have told me if it wasn't up to snuff, turned to me and said, man, it sounds like you never missed a day. Guys, the system works. He was off his horn for three years. He used it for two weeks and he was back blown as good as strong as he ever had been. Now, I don't know what his Clarks felt like. You know, maybe his finger coordination wasn't there, but he sure played the gig well, you know. And at the end of the day, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it works. It works. That works. Um, so so what's next for you, Larry? You, you know, you're talking about uh, you, you, you have a, a new project going on, uh, part two of the Trumpet Legacy. So uh, what's that all about? Okay, well, that's... In, in, in a trumpet legacy one, we learned to work arpeggios over 22 different jazz chords. You know, instead of just doing arpeggio, da, 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 how many years did I waste time doing that? I wasn't a waste of time, but I didn't learn anything. Well, now I formatted it into, you know, C11, you know, the 11 chord, the, you know, an augmented chord, diminished chord, on and on and on, so that we learn not only the chord, that the, the, what spells out those chords, the, the elements of the chords, um, C13, for example, ba bu da do 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 deep. Now, we know what those notes are. And now we also learn the scale that goes with that chord. So that was the routine I built on a Trumpet Legacy 1. 
I always promised a sequel so that we could it'd be, that's the first part of the routine. And then now we're building a second part of the routine where we're working the coordination of fingers and tongue. And so now we're building exercises over the same chord groups, but the scale patterns change according to the, 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 the chord change, the chord symbol. So now you see the chord symbol, you see the elements of the chord, you learn the most probable scale that you can play against that chord, and now we're building a vocabulary or strength around that chord. And then changing it every time the change chord, every time we change the chord. So there's several exercises, there's interval studies, there's chord studies, there's uh, flexibility study, there's finger studies, all based upon that particular chord for the week. So now we can do a trumpet legacy one and pair it with a trumpet legacy two and have a complete routine. And when we are finished with that 22 week study, you got some jazz chops. You may not know your have you know the ability to swing or whatever, but you can look at those chords. You know exactly what to play over them. You know what's permissible to play over them are the most obvious notes that you should play over them. So I think it's a good work. Mm -hmm. um, it's taken me a lot of years to work it out. Finally, I found a copyist who would do it for me, and it's been a lot of work. So we're, we're compiling that. What's next for me? I'm working um, a lot in Los Angeles now, and I'm starting to make inroads on some of the better bands, rehearsal bands and such, you know, playing with some really strong players next to me. That's always fun. Um, I just purchased a really good microphone. I'm going to go up to Hollywood next week, week and hang out all day with Greg Cruz, who's one of the um, top call studio uh, engineers in Los Angeles. And he's going to show me how to make use my own home studio to you know get started anyway. So I'm going to start recording some things. I'm a good player. Nobody knows about it because they haven't heard me. So it's time to put it out. So that's that's next on the agenda is to get some get some good recordings out there as well. So. Yeah, time time to put it out. It's time for a uh, uh, sixty. How old are you? Sixty five. Sixty five years old. Yeah, I'm an old man. Time for a 65 year old man to, to start making some waves. So. Well, yeah, you know, I've been hidden in, in six foot under venues all my life, cruise ships, theme parks, what have you. And nobody's really heard what I can do. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm just the guy who talks about the trumpet. I'm not the guy who plays the trumpet. Yeah. Well, you know, and that that's a very important lesson, I think, for everybody to take, uh, take in mind that, that, you know, I, I, I'm just a few years younger than you. I'm, yeah, I'm 60 years old. Um, and it irks me when, when someone tells me that they're too old to do something, they're too old to try something new. Uh, and, uh, wait, I normally say, yeah, you're right. Uh, even though they're a lot of times you're younger than me, but th they're too old because they think they're too old. You know, as long as you have that spirit, uh, that inquisitive spirit, that, uh, that drive to to push yourself a little bit further and to experiment with new things, experience new things, then you're never too old. You know, uh, Harold Mitchell told me that if you're if you're, step, you're taking two steps, if you're not constantly moving up, you take one day off, you take two steps back. If you're not constantly learning, you're taking you're slipping. So you're going up an incline like this, and you're always learning. You're always finding something new. You're walking towards success. But if you take time off of that, you're going to start sliding. So every day you got you have to push yourself to learn a little bit more and increments baby steps tiny baby steps will get you to the top of the of, of the mountain but yeah. if you look at the you know even up to quarter the way up the mountain and try and breach that in one step you're going to fail but if you just take it little by little well, okay today we're going to learn the c major scale we're going to know that it goes over a c major chord Okay, well, we got that down. What's next? Oh, now we got C minor. Let's learn that one. Before we know it, when we look back, we're already on top of the mountain, and we look back and we see it all the, all the time, we've, what we've learned, because we've taken the time to take the, the baby steps to the peak of the mountain. Yeah. And you can apply that concept to anything you do in life. Absolutely. Anything. Absolutely. It's like one of my, my favorite quotes is, how you do anything is how you do everything. So, uh, you know, that's, that's it, man. That's the secret to everything. So uh, we've got a, a few uh, stock segments that we need to get through uh, before we can call it a day. 
Uh, and uh, the first one is uh, brought to us by a friend, uh, Michael Barkley of Bi Barkley Microphones. Barkley I'm going to get one of those, by the way. Oh, man, they are great microphones, I tell yeah. you what. Uh, and this is called Sound Off, and Sound Off is about your approach to sound. Now, we talk, we've we been talking about chops, uh, but uh, let's talk a second about uh, some of the concepts that you have about uh, about sound development, uh, getting getting that trumpet sound. And, and what, are, what are some of the, the hints that you would give someone who's looking to create a beautiful trumpet sound? What, what would you tell them to to do to in order to do that uh, more efficiently? Well, you know, I think it is important to educate yourself to what a good sound is. Uh, one of the best uh, online programs for teaching that I've ever seen comes from Ronald Rome and the Rome teaching, what's the name of their institute there? And the, he's got a, a, a thing where you, you play, you hear his beautiful sound and you copy that beautiful sound. It's a great program for success, taking baby steps as we talked before. Check that out. Um, Ronald Rome, the, the Rome uh, Institute. Academy. I think it's called the Rome Academy. Yep. Mm -hmm. trumpet. Really good stuff. But the important thing is that we know what the sound is going to be. Harold Mitchell said this. He said, know before you blow or think before you stink. You've got to have a good concept of what a sound is before you can make a good sound. You know, and a lot of times we'll get a student in that doesn't have a good concept of sound. We have to educate them to what that is. They've got to hear it, they've got to memorize it, and they've got to try and copy it. Students always sound like their instructors or their teachers. So it's important for us to give them a good example so that they can copy it. And just the act of copying that good sound automatically puts the body in good form because you, the, the sound is your guide. By the way, it was not, um, uh, that was Harold Mitchell who said that first. Bill Adams studied from my teacher, Harold Mitchell. And that's where that phrase came from. The sound is your guide. That's all Harold Mitchell. You know, you, you find that, that sound and that puts you in the right position and the right coordination. So you've got to have a good idea what the sound's going to be before you can produce it. And once you do produce it, you, you memorize it because now you're finding the right muscular coordination. Okay. Simple as that. So everybody should have a beautiful sound. If you follow Larry's suggestions, so all right. So our next segment is uh, called "Geared Up," and "Geared Up" is brought to us by Venture Mouthpieces, where technology, design, and craftsmanship intersect. Uh, use the code Trumpet Gurus Twenty One to get ten percent off your order. And uh, "Geared Up" is not. Uh, I, I know you do have a, a signature uh, horn that has been designed for you. We can talk a little bit about that, but uh, I definitely want to talk more. Uh, you know, approach it more from the perspective uh, perspective of uh, how you view the role of equipment in in playing and how someone should approach their gear if they're not getting the results that they're looking to get out of their playing. I don't care what you hand me. It can, it can even be leaky, a leaking horn. I'm somehow going to figure out a way to make a good sound out of it. Um, I had a beautiful Bach 37 years ago that got destroyed on stage. So I had to go out and park. I was on board ship. I was in Miami. I gave my trumpet to Dennis Noday, who took it to the shop for me. And um, I went out to the pawn shop and bought a $99 Chinese trumpet. I, found, I sounded fine on it. I mean, it wasn't perfect. I mean, there was there were some intonation issues, and it was a little bit tight, but I found a balance, and I was able to play it. I kept playing it for the entire contract and put my, my Bach in the case when it came back. I didn't want it to get screwed up again. But my point is this. We should not expect improvements by changing the brass. We should expect improvements by changing us. Don't expect the brass to adapt to you. The brass, you must adapt to the brass. Brass can't adapt to you. You have to adapt to the brass. And it goes back to that concept of sound that you have in your head and learning how to make adjustments to make that happen. Sure, I had to adjust pitch here and there on that horn. Sure, it was a little bit tight, but I just learned how to find the balance on it. I adapted to the brass. Okay, having said that, what's the difference between that 99-cent horn and, and uh, a Monet or a... Uh, or a Yamaha, or a Benj, or an Eclipse, or 
a professional model trumpet. There's many of them out there, but uh, Quadro makes a great one. Warburton makes a great horn. It's gotten to the point where they're all good, you know, it, and uh, what makes that play so much better? Well, it's more in tune. The slots are there and there's a better balance on the airstream. But at the end of the day, if we don't have the concepts in our head, we're not going to make it happen. Don't adapt, adapt to the brass. Don't expect the brass to adapt to you. I, you know, I can play on anything and still make it happen. I mean, I'd be the most comfortable, but I can do it. It's us. It's not the horn. That's my answer to that question. Well, that's good. Yeah, I mean, it's like uh, I have a friend who's a, a bass player, and um, I used to always uh, I was I was amazed because he had the most beautiful sound. Mm -hmm. on his bass and he was playing uh w an old silver tone bass his parents got for him out of the sears catalog when he was in in uh, high school i mean it was a piece of crap bass but he sounded like he was playing a, he had groove didn't he he yeah he just he had a feel and, and he could pick up any bass and it will always sound like him yes which, which is a good thing I mean, like yeah. me, I can pick up any trumpet and it'll sound like me, and that's not necessarily a compliment. So, you know, you 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 have to develop that sound concept, like you said, and and when that drives you, then then you will make the adjustment. So, I really really like that concept. All right, so we, so we have one final thing to get through, and this is brought to us by Robinson's Remedies. This is a Robinson's Remedy rapid fire round. Robinson's Remedy bring you products that give you rapid release relief for those tire chops. So, if you haven't done enough uh, reps on your CTS. And you're feeling tired, you can uh, use uh, that lip renew and 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 get another uh, uh, another few bars out before you you fold. So I got to try that product. Everybody talks about it. There's all lots of of great uh, comments I hear about, it, but I've not, never had a chance to try it. I, you know what? I will send you. If I don't send you, I'll, I'll have Kenny send you. Send Good. You some samples I'd like to try it because actually, that's a great. It's a great adjunct to uh, to the CTS because after you get that burn going, you just put a little bit on and and uh, helps with that lactic acid uh, just going bye bye. Well, yeah, that's an important point, and I, I won't take up any more time that I don't have. But we have to clear the lactic acid out of our systems. You know, we've got to get rid of that we got by allowing for circulation because that's how we rejuvenate the chops. We get rid of the lactic acid and we, we get new fresh blood and oxygen in there and they start to build up. But if we never allow that rest or, or, or that circulation, we're just gonna continue to tear the chops down. So yeah. good point. Yeah. All right, well, here we go. It's a series of uh, questions all over the place. We just need your quickest response. And let's start with this first one. Larry, who's the biggest influence on your life that is not a trumpet player? Jesus Christ. All right. What is your favorite book? I'm sounding like, like, like a conservative right winger. The Bible. All right. Uh, what's the worst movie you've ever seen? <laughs> um, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. Okay. But it was okay. a great score because Gordon Goodwin did it. Yeah. <laughs> that was about all that that movie was good for. Uh, if you weren't a trumpet player, what would you want to be? That's a good question. I've never wanted to be anything else. Um, I did a lot of other things, but I never wanted to do them. Um, I would I don't know. That's a, I, I wish I could answer that. A psychologist. Okay. Uh, what's your favorite drink? Orange juice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Being from California, that's a good thing, I bet. Uh, you could have uh, a dinner party and invite any three living people, who would you invite? Uh, okay, let's see. Arturo Sandoval. They got to be living, huh? Arturo Sandoval. Um, I would say uh, Chris Bode, because I love his pie, and Wayne Bergeron. That's okay. A good conversation. That sounds like a good dinner. Uh yeah. You have three additional chairs at your table. You can invite any three people from history, any three people that are no longer with us. Louis Armstrong, Dizzy Gillespie, my father. Oh, see, now, that, now that's a dinner party. <laughs> All right. Lacquer, plated, or raw? Um, 
I like them all for this for different reasons. They both they all three have different characteristics, and I can't really choose. Right now, I'm playing a raw horn. Okay, uh, what's your favorite quote? They call it luck when opportunity meets preparedness. Ah, that's one of my favorites too. Um, what is your greatest fear? Greatest fear. I, you know, I, I've experienced so much adversity in my life that I've learned not to worry about fear. I trust God for everything I do. I'm, I've been homeless. I've been through. I've been through the ringer, and I've had problems with my health on and on and on. I, 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 I'm not afraid of much. I'm not afraid of death. Um, I guess I'd be afraid of somebody uh, 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 being being innocent but being accused. That would be something to be a bad position in. Yeah. Okay. There's not much. There's not much that I'm afraid of. Good. All right. Uh, you could be granted one superpower. What would it be? Well, if I had a real superpower, um, I to be Wayne Bergeron. <laughs> <laughs> he's a superman yeah, well, he's mr incredible uh, yeah he is yeah, yeah every yeah. once in a while i'll get tired on a lead chart and I'll, I'll say to my lead player i'll say where's wayne when i need him <laughs> <laughs> i think a lot of us have said that i think wayne has even said that a few times <laughs> probably so <laughs> uh, what aspect of trumpet playing do you feel is the most overrated High notes. Okay. What aspect do you think is the most underrated? Um, musicality. Tone. Tone. Oh. Tone it is. Yep. Um, you can go back in time and give your younger self one piece of advice about music. What would it be? About music. What would it be? Okay, um, go to college, study the genres. Okay, and while you're back there, you're going to give your younger self one piece of advice about life. Um, stay clean and sober. <laughs> All right, and finey, fine, finey, finally, <laughs> Larry, what do you want your legacy to be? I just hope that I've been able to further our craft a little bit more with my insights learned from these wonderful people that I've studied with. That's my aspiration. Well, you are certainly doing them proud. Um, you know, you've done a, a phenomenal job of, of taking your, your knowledge, your experience, and uh, which, you know, we all know that, that most of that always comes from those that, that went before us. So uh, you've done a good job of bringing that and, and codifying that in a way that that makes sense. So uh, I certainly, I for one, personally appreciate all your efforts. So uh, and I'm looking forward to what you've got up your sleeve next, my friend. It's coming. It is. I know I've been promising it for a lot of years, but it's coming. Finally, it's there. Yeah, yeah. Well, good, good. So uh, thank you for taking time uh, to be with me today, Larry. And thank you for joining us for this hang. Uh, remember, you can. Uh, it was not you can you should i'm going to just be very positive you should subscribe uh you should like you should share uh and uh you know spread the word that, that the hang is the place to be to to get a chance to know uh some of the the most amazing individuals and uh i hope that if nothing else that you learned from larry today it's the importance of just just keeping on baby steps every day uh, and don't don't let life get in your way you know don't let the brass get in your way. Don't let life get in your way. Amen to that. Yeah. www.trumpetlegacy.com. You'll find me there. Yeah. All right. Absolutely. Yes. And uh, yeah. links in the show notes. And uh, please, please help uh, help support uh, Larry and, and all of our other five uh, vendors and uh, sponsors for the show. And uh, keep an eye out. For, for Larry's next project. I think you're going to love it. So as always, folks, peace and slide grease. Thank yeah. you. Thanks for hanging with us today. This podcast is all about creating deeper connections through our mutual love of music and the trumpet life. 
Make sure you subscribe to this podcast and also like and share this episode with a friend. We want to see the hang grow for show. Please support our sponsors and consider becoming a personal supporter of this podcast as well. Remember, for less than the price of a bottle of olive oil a month, you can keep this podcast moving smoothly. The Trumpet Guru's Hang is recorded at the Candy Factory, a co-working space and social club located in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Jose Johnson is the executive producer. Post-production editing is by Mitch Bowers. Our opening theme song was composed and performed by Lexi Signal. And our closing theme music comes courtesy of The Greatest Funeral Ever. Incidental music is by Ethan Swayze and Jose Johnson. Graphic design by Ann Kirby of The Sweet Corps. The Trumpet Guru's Hang podcast is produced in collaboration with the So Good Lancaster Media Group.